Hello, 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 hello. Hey, it's the great Johannes here for yet another podcast episode. Let's start off with an important question. What do you think is the number one reason that some men become misogynistic or outright women haters? And I think the answer is not at all toxic masculinity, as though being raised as a man makes you hate women. But who raises the man? Isn't it the mother? Why would a mother raise a boy in such a manner that he grows up to become a man who hates women? In other words, what role do mothers play in making men hate women? So I picked up a book by Richard Reeves. It's titled On Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Suffering. The book is written by a man who is essentially a feminist ally. He goes along a long way with the narrative that uh, women are simply naturally superior to men, intellectually speaking, and that it's only natural for men then to become stay-at-home dads so that women can excel and soar in the careers and on jobs and so on. And don't worry about heavy-duty lifting. Those kinds of jobs will, be, uh, will disappear. They will be replaced by robots. So the men who still do some heavy-duty lifting or even truck drivers and so on, the men who do the hard work, right? hard and boring work. Mind you, a lot of work is extremely boring. Someone has to do it. Usually it's men who do those kinds of jobs. And the feminists and the technocrats working together are saying uh, those jobs will disappear. There will be no more need for muscle in the future. Uh, and so we don't need men. We don't need men to go to the gym anymore to stay strong. In fact, they want women to become the physically stronger sex as well. And then you can only guess what they have in mind next. Uh, the radical feminists, they want to eradicate the male sex altogether. So I've written down a couple of quotes from this book by Richard Reeves. Let's just go through some of them. And then I want to show you how wrong feminists are. Namely, they are deluding themselves to think that we're living in one kind of reality based on their perception, but we are actually living in another kind of reality that does require men to be manly and strong. And I'm going to show this to you. So the first quote I want to discuss is this one. This is uh, Reeves himself. To me, to me, it seems clear that girls and women were always better equipped to succeed at college, just as in high school, and that this has become apparent as gendered assumptions about college have fallen away. He means to say that women were always intellectually more gifted than men, and this has finally come to light after we broke down those patriarchal structures that kept women imprisoned in their homes. They weren't allowed to study. They weren't allowed to go to education or whatever. Uh, this, of course, is total nonsense. He adds that there is no century-long conspiracy of feminists uh, in the education system to uh, hurt boys, basically, to change education in such a manner that women will, will end up doing better by new measures and the boys will fall off because they get bored with the work, for example. But of course, you don't need a century-old conspiracy. It's enough to have a decade-old conspiracy. If this started in the 1970s when women... Feminist women really did begin to change our education system in North America and Europe and elsewhere throughout the West. We changed it in such a manner that girls would be able to uh, succeed on certain tasks over boys. Uh, mathematics or algebra or calculus comes to mind. Uh, it used to be so that you would be given an assignment in school. Uh, it was a fairly complicated assignment and you were just supposed to give the answer. Nowadays, in the Dutch education system, I know that they've changed mathematics in such a manner that you have to um, explain every step along the way to get to the answer, meaning, meaning you have to verbalize everything you do in your mind. Ha! Surprise, surprise. Of course, girls are better at verbalizing the steps they take, but it also makes such exercises, uh, exercises tedious for boys. It makes boys feel bored. Why can't they just use their intelligence to solve a problem and just give you the answer rather than have to verbalize, verbally walk through every step along the way? Of course, boys are going to fall off when you change education in this manner, and it has happened. 
But the claim itself is wrong that women were somehow uh, uh, intellectually more equipped for uh, going to university and college and doing all the top jobs like being doctors and nurses. It is actually total nonsense. I could give some personal examples. I met a girl who studied something like econometrics or something or uh, uh, accounting. And she had an accounting job at an accounting firm in a big city in the Netherlands. And after six months, she just gave up. She quit. And do you know why? Because she was too physically exhausted from office work. Can you get that? Can you believe that? That there are these, you know, women who just can't even stand a nine to five office job. It exhausts them physically to the point where they just quit. Um, I once dated uh, an ENT doctor, a woman, a female doctor who operates your ear, nose and throat. She was specializing in the ears and she told me there's a simple reason why women who study medicine will drop out around age 30. So they graduate as a doctor, they're officially doctors, but they quit working at age 30, you know why? Of course, they get a baby, but do you know what the real reason is why they never come back in the, back to the medical profession? So my female doctor friend explained it to me. The only reason these women study medicine is so that they can, can get close to the top doctors in the, in the hospitals, uh, have a child with one of them. And once they have the child, they're all set because they can live off that rich doctor's salary and his income. So they don't have to work anymore. That's the whole point. A lot of women don't study because they care about having a career in some field for 40 years. They just care about meeting the richer men in those fields. In fact, in fact, what I say I know is true because another research has shown that as colleges and universities become more feminized, meaning more and more a larger share of the students uh, studying at these universities uh, are women now, if the share of females is too large, uh, females, female students stop applying for those studies and for those universities. Meaning when women realize that a university is full of women, they don't want to go there anymore because they don't go there for the study. They go there to meet a mate, a rich mate. So let's move on to another, uh, another quote from that book. As the muscular demands of work decline, men are becoming weaker. Meanwhile, women are getting stronger. In 1985, the average man in his 30s in the USA could squeeze your hand with about 30 pounds more force than a woman. And today, 2022, or I don't know when the book was written, but today their grip strength is about the same. I don't even believe this. You have to watch out here. You have to know the difference between fact and proclamation. A lot of these sort of people on the left side, they proclaim things that are not necessarily rooted in reality. They may have found one or the other research that said so, but they didn't do the meta research. They didn't look at all the other research, whether or not it is really going on. I find it hard to believe that today, um, the average white U.S. male would only be as strong as the average white U.S. female. That is not true. Of course, there are weak men and there are very strong women. But on average, the men are still stronger than women. We know that, for example, men still outrun women on the marathons. Men certainly outbench women on the bench press. I don't believe it. I don't buy that uh, men are as strong as women now. But do you see why they write this? Uh, so if we assume just for a moment, we pretend that this is true or, or whether or not we don't know if it's true or if they're proclaiming this. I don't even care to know because what is really about this, this is this paragraph, this quote I read to you expresses the feminists need or their desire to transform the sexes. They want to re, uh, invert the genders or reverse the sexes so that the men become as though women, men become physically weak and they should then become stay-at-home dads. And they want the women to become both physically stronger and, uh, uh, and the leading uh, people in society as well. So they just want to reverse the sexes, which is interesting because that means if, if all you're doing is inverting the gender roles, yeah, what are you doing? You're not really changing anything. All you're doing is you're making women into men and men into women, and you're back at the same, kind of the same situation, all you've done is inverted the genders. I don't believe that's possible, of course. 
I don't personally believe you can invert the genders. This is, this is not going to happen. Again, we're dealing with people who proclaim their worldview as though it is already fact, but it's not. It, basically, they're expert liars. Uh, next quote. The women's movement is about liberation. Above all, this meant economic independence for women from men. This goal has been largely accomplished in, lo in advanced societies. Okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I don't think in the past 50 years or so that any man or woman in the West had any awareness at all whatsoever that uh, liberating women from men was somehow a goal that we were working toward as a society. We were not. Again, this is a proclamation. It's not really rooted in fact. Women, of course, have not become independent at all. Women may, in the past, have been dependent on a man's income, or rather on a man earning them an income. It didn't mean that men had financial power over women. Even in the 1950s, it was the woman who decided what to spend the money on. Uh, frequently, the woman would simply control the man's assets. She would control his labor, his assets, his money, his income. The man didn't have the power to you know, make women do what he wanted them to do. He was more like a slave, a labor slave to his own family. And women are not independent today. Women are now dependent on their employers and they are dependent on the state. And most of these employers, mind you, are still men. And how does that make sense that you made women financially independent from their husbands, but now you've made them financially dependent on corporations and governments. How was that smart? How was that a smart idea where you say that we have accomplished this independence in, in advanced societies? Don't you see that you've done it wrong? You didn't make women independent. You made them dependent on earning their own income, making them dependent on employers, corporations, businesses, governments, and programs. Huh? <laughs> That's not independence. Oh, let's move on to uh, another quote. Uh, so they were measuring men and women's brains to see what the differences were. For every brain measure that showed large sex differences between men and women, there was always overlap between males and females. And there was about 48% overlap. In other words, the differences are dimorphic rather than binary. Ah. Here's where that talk of binary, this and that comes from. They say, don't say binary, don't say men and women. But, uh, okay, when they speak of overlap, they mean that you have, say, men on the left and men, women on the right, and they kind of overlap somewhere. So there's in the middle part. So in the middle part, there are some women who are more masculine than average men, and there are some men who are more feminine than average women. However, this is called being, this is called dimorphic. Yes, we understand that, but however, they are what they introduce here is a straw man argument. They pretend as though in the past we always saw everything as perfectly binary, like men and women, rather than a spectrum, a dimorphic spectrum. But we didn't. If you read the old literature from the 19th, 18th century, it's clear that everybody, all this, all the scientists, the male scientists of the past, understood very clearly what spectrums are and that things can be dimorphic rather than perfectly binary binary. We know that. We always knew that. It's a, it's a straw man argument. They're arguing against something that was never so. But here's the thing. In so-called primitive societies, I would say traditional societies, such as in uh, Africa or India, uh, where you still find them, here you also have effeminate men. But guess what? They are not called gay. They are not called trans or effeminate or weak or unmanly. They are still called men, and they still marry women. And that's the difference between traditional society and our modernized societies, where uh, we say to men who are not very manly, we say to them, oh, you're an effeminate man, therefore you're not a real man. Or you're a masculine woman, you're a tomboy, you're a butch, so you're not a real woman, you're, you're more like a man. Why don't you change your gender? Ah, see, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to play on the insecurities of men and women, the men who are somewhat effeminate, the women who are somewhat 
too masculine and they play on their insecurities to make them believe that they're really transgender. They should just change their sex. They're just trapped in the wrong body. See what they're doing? They're playing tricks with your mind. Why do you think that the trans movement was able to have a grasp on people at all? Isn't it obvious? Say you're a 15-year-old boy, right? You're small. You're physically small. You're nowhere near the 1980s action ideal of Arnold Schwarzenegger or, or The Rock or, uh, or, or Sylvester Stallone. You're not that huge. In fact, men don't really get physically big until their 30s or so. It takes a long time to grow into your bigger self, into your bigger body, right? But the problem is they tell this 15-year-old kid, oh, you look kind of effeminate. You're not a real man yet. You'll never be a real man. Why don't you try being trans? See, why don't you try being gay, right? See, that's what they do. So they play on the insecurities of young people who have not yet grown into their final bodies anyway. And even if they are going to be more effeminate or overly masculine, if you're a girl, that still doesn't mean you're the opposite sex. An effeminate man, by my book, is still a man. And a masculine woman, by my book, is still a woman. And I want to wrap it up by giving them one simple piece of advice. It turns out, according to this book, that 80% of psychologists are women. 80% of psychologists are women. If you're a man and if you're depressed, I think the best thing you could do is avoid psychologists altogether and join a boxing club or a lacrosse club or any kind of club where you join some other guys who are probably a lot like you anyway. There's, these are guys who also didn't have friends. They also joined the same club because they also didn't have a, a friendship and, and fun in life. So you go and join this club once a week on Sunday afternoons or Saturday mornings, whichever suits you, right? And you join this club with other men. And I believe after a few weeks or months, you're going to make some friends there. You're going to make some friends there, friends you can even go out with. That's what you're supposed to do. Don't go to a psychologist. Join a sports club. You have to join... You know, as a man, if you want to achieve anything in life, we don't achieve things on our own. We don't live alone. Men join outfits. They join clubs. Hey, you want to join some secret society? Go ahead and do that. You, you want to be in one of those elite clubs for the high society, for the, you know, the upper classes? If you can get into those, get into those. But join some fucking club and, and find your peers, your other men who are suffering just the way you are. And then you can fight together. And that's what it's all about.